Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, a clinical microbiologist and the chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic and the president of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in laboratory testing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So Bill, welcome back. Good to talk to you this week again. Another week, another chat with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with Parasite Gal from Twitter fame. Yeah, of course, we've been talking not so much about parasites, but more about viruses and COVID-19. Of course, yeah. that's the hot topic these days. Um, but I was really excited. I got my first dose of the vaccine last week, and I heard you got yours as well. And I was, did. Uh, I showed did. it off on Twitter, which is yep, great. I did. I did. Yep, that caused quite the little Twitter storm. It was, it was fun. Yeah, you were showing off your muscles while you got your Twitter. That's great. <laughs> inadvertently, inadvertently, that wasn't <laughs> the purpose, but that's, yeah. So I think vaccines would be a good thing to talk about because as we know, the vaccine is our best prevention method for uh, coronavirus once we developed herd immunity, of course. Meanwhile, we're gonna be wearing our masks and keeping distancing. Um, but I know that some people are still trying to decide when the vaccine is available to them, are they gonna get vaccinated? So it probably would be good to just talk about the vaccine and maybe debunk some of the myths of what you know people might be hearing um, that might be pushing them away from getting vaccinated. Yeah, no, I think it's really important to, for, for us to discuss and for healthcare, people in healthcare to say what we know about the vaccines and what we don't and just be honest so people can make the best choices for them. Um, you know, I, one of the things that for people to remember just any vaccine, any vaccination uh, program really has two, two intents, right? And I think people often lose that. And the one is to vaccinate people to protect them from a pathogen, right? So mm -hmm. getting a vaccine, um, you know, if you're going to be traveling overseas, for instance, at certain locations, you need to be vaccinated before you go um, prophylactically to protect you from infection. But also the purpose of vaccines is to actually help control the spread or ideally eradicate diseases, right? Mm -hmm. And you think about smallpox and polio yeah. and other scourges of mankind, which have really been either eliminated or, or pushed to the fringe of elimination through vaccine uh, programs. And so that's the really the, uh, people. And, and so we tend to look at this through one lens or the other oftentimes, but it's really both that we need mm -hmm. to think about and talk about. Yeah, a lot of advantages with vaccination. Yeah. Well, I think one of the big myths that I've heard people say is, well, how do we know it's safe? It was so rapidly developed and tested. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I trust it is what I'm hearing people say. What would, what would be good advice that we could give our colleagues if you hear that type of message? Well, uh, you know, I think there's a couple of things that, again, it's, it's understandable. People aren't really privy to a lot of the information. And this is all, again, very new. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that people need, a lot, a lot of that is concern around the new vaccines, which use only the uh, mRNA for the, so basically the genetic code for the spike protein, which is delivered as a vaccine, and then your body makes the protein as opposed to other vaccines, which either introduce a protein or some form of the virus inactivated or attenuated, meaning it can't really replicate. So this is new. And so people are right away, like, and I never heard of it before. Actually, I, and I hadn't, I mean, but that's what people are saying. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the reality is that, and I learned this, I got a chance to, to participate in a webinar um, with the former commission of the FDA under the Bush administration, who talked about, I think it's Dr. Van Eschenberg, but I might be wrong on the name, but, but essentially talked about how this technology was actually first explored with the avian flu um, under the Bush administration and the recognition that uh, vaccines took so long to develop that we needed alternate technologies. Really vaccine technologies had not changed for decades. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so this, this technology of using the mRNA is actually that's something that's been invested in uh, by the federal government actually for, for oh, at least the last 10 years. So it's new to us, but it's really not new. And it has been tried and explored in some other pandemics, including Ebola. It just never was needed widespread, thankfully, because those never became global scourges as COVID has. So, so yeah, so yeah, there's a lot, it's new, but it's not that new. And again, the safety data 
really a lot of what we've seen has become it's come so fast is because of the global effort and the alignment of, of, of forces between the federal government, the pharmaceutical industry, healthcare practices to create quickly the safety data to say that the that the vaccines are safe. Um, when and again, these are the safety is monitored by independent boards that look at the safety, just like we did for the convalescent plasma for the expanded access program led by Mayo that had a safety board like any trial mm -hmm. to look at a program like this. Um, so they looked and the safety data was strong. Um, and so in terms of two months, it really appeared to be quite safe and even more efficacious than they hoped. And that's the day we go on. I do think, though, as Dr. our colleague, Dr. Poland, uh, has talked a lot about, and people can look for his work as well. He's been very much in the public domain. There is a difference between an emergency youth authorization and full FDA approval, and we just need to be honest about that, that the, the FDA has said the safety data that they have shows that this is safe. We don't have the long-term data that you would see in a typical FDA approval, so we can't answer some of those questions, but, but, uh, um, there are, so that's, but, but I think everything points to it being safe. Yeah, I, that's the same thing I've seen, Bill. And I like how you've said that if people are asked and they want to share information, they could say that it is uh, several safety boards. First of all, the FDA uh, has been uh, has reviewed all of the data, but also there's an independent evaluation, the Advisory Committee on Immunization, and they have conducted this independent evaluation of safety data. They followed up on at least half of all the study participants for at least two months. Um, and then, of course, each in this in this institution is also evaluating the safety data. For example, I know that Mayo Clinic has its own panel of experts that have evaluated the safety data before they start administering the vaccine to their staff. Yep. I also like the point you made about how far we've come. Um, this mRNA vaccine has some has been something that we've been building upon and studying for you know over a decade so it's not new technology this is just the first time that we've been able to use it but reflecting back on the older vaccines where you'd grow up live virus that's attenuated so it's weakened and it's not as severe and growing up it growing it up in chicken eggs you know it's really older technology those older vaccines so i think the new vaccine has some really important things that uh, it has going for it you know people with egg allergies don't have to worry about getting this vaccine. It's not a live virus. Even if it was a weakened virus, it's not at all. This isn't a live attenuated virus. So you're not gonna get COVID from the vaccine. And those are you know, things that I think a lot of people maybe don't realize about this new vaccine. Yeah, and I, and I would also, yeah, I agree. And it's, it's look, it's very challenging. And I know that uh, uh, from, from close friends and, 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 and family members, who are out looking for information, uh, it is challenging because even in the scientific literature, there's some spectrum of opinions being proffered about the vaccine itself. Um, one of the things that, that's been out there is that the, the spike protein has some homology, meaning similarity to a protein that's expressed in, in human placenta and that this somehow might cause infertility. Um, you know, that's, and that's been, you know, I, and that actually, as I point out to the person that, that that raised that with me, the reality is that if that's the case, then even infection by you should actually be should be immunized because the greater risk would be from actual infection where you got overwhelmed with lots and lots of live virus. So I think that the most important thing for people is to find a trusted site like mayoclinic.org or something else that's going to look at lots of different information and bring it back together for us. And then also there's people that, you know, have said, well, gosh, and there's been in, in the lay press about uh, someone got a vaccine. This is one that's been out there, and they and it, it was a physician that shortly after their vaccine had a had a fatal stroke, and that oh my gosh, we should stop, uh, we should stop the vaccine. It's not safe. Well, when we're giving the vaccine to millions of people, unfortunately, people will have health events after the vaccine that are likely unrelated, um, and most and that because then they look back to the data again and they continue to monitor. So. So again, I think the most important thing is to not to read individual pieces of information, but find a source that you really trust that has all, all the information kind of uh, that's been reviewed and then presented to you in a way that you, that's really fair because mm -hmm. the individual pieces can really lead you down some, some uh, different rabbit holes.
Mayo Clinic has some great information on this too. If anyone does an internet search for Mayo Clinic COVID-19 vaccine, um, and we can include a link in uh, the information about our podcast, there are uh, multiple sources, including question and answer sessions with just really good digestible information that uh, everyone can understand. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And look, it's, uh, and I think going back to everyone watching this podcast or listening to it, is I, you know, is to recognize this is an individual decision. I mean, I have to say, when I got the vaccine, it was a little, uh, it was, I wouldn't say I had trepidation, but it was a little different. I was thinking, gosh, this is so new. It's, it's so different. And I'm getting a shot. Um, but the reality is you have to weigh um, also the, what we know with what we about the vaccine itself and what we know the vaccine can do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important, number one, for individuals. I get it. It's, it's a decision you have to make, but you have to recognize that that COVID, you should not minimize the risk of COVID infection. We're learning more and more about individuals who get infected who get really sick and including young individuals. And, and now the, the whole, um, that there's this post-viral syndrome from COVID infection that people are getting so-called long COVID or long haulers is a real thing with things like central sensitization, which can lead to pain phenomena. So there are a lot of downsides to getting the infection that we do know that you need to take into consideration with the with the some of the unknowns that we don't have with the vaccines. And again, look, I don't think there's anyone, there's probably a very small segment of society that wanted to wear a mask, but most people don't. Most people want to get get back to normal is what we hear. We want to get back to being able to do the things we want to do. Uh, we have friends with small businesses that we really worry about. And again, taking and keeping in mind that the more if you're comfortable getting the vaccine, the the more people that get the vaccine, the great, it's really our greatest uh, hope for getting out in front of this and getting back to a normal, a normal way of life. Yeah, well, and Bill, you raise a, another myth that perhaps we can debunk here. Uh, the myth that you don't need to wear a mask after you get the vaccine. Um, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and it's interesting that, uh, and this is, uh, there's also for people that wanna know, there was also a paper, I believe last week, uh, published about looking at the healthcare workers in the UK who had natural infection. And it was a really well done study where they actually looked at uh, what they had, uh, you know, surveillance PCR testing for the virus itself and serology and other things. What they found is that it's true, the rate of reinfection, even from natural infection is very low, but there were some people in that group that had positive PCRs that were not sick well after they had recovered from COVID. And so the thought is that probably immunity protects us from really getting ill with COVID, but not, might not protect us from having COVID in our system and, and therefore being able to spread it to others. That's why we need to wear masks, either if we've been sick with COVID before or after we get vaccinated. Because remembering masks, masking is really prevent you from, from inadvertently spreading COVID to others. And there will be that until we reach a level of herd immunity, that risk will persist. Um, and I think it's really important for us, you know, working in a healthcare uh, organization like Mayo Clinic, because some of the people coming here for care are those who are going to be more susceptible to COVID because they're immunosuppressed because of therapies or a disease or something else. Yeah. Yeah. So vaccination will help us get in front of this, but until everyone's vaccinated, I think we do need to continue wearing masks and that's pretty clear. And it is gonna take a while to get everyone to have their two doses with the two vaccines that we're using uh, in which there's more than you know 21 days or more between the two doses. Yeah. So good to remember that, don't give up your mask yet. Yep, the other thing I wanna bring up is that, you know, uh, that as a Catholic, I think that there are some people that have a religious considerations when when uh, when going for a vaccine in terms of how it's produced um, that there's a lot of good information there the catholic medical association for instance has a position you know that goes through all the vaccines and goes through you know what what some of the religious uh, to help you with that choice again it's a very personal one but again don't trust the lay press on things like that really go mm -hmm. if you have you have some kind of religious or other sort of consideration for the vaccine you should really go to, to a trusted source that can provide guidance because I think all of them are. Yeah, good point. I have one last myth that we can cover. Uh, what if a patient says, well, or a person says, well, I already had COVID, so I don't need to get the vaccine when it's available. Well, there's a couple things, you know, uh, first of all, the, getting the vaccine, we're not even at, at Mayo testing to see if someone's had prior exposure. We're just vaccinating them unless they've been sick with COVID documented within, you know, 90 days of, of, of 
their time to get vaccinated. But the reality is that the reason we want to vaccinate people, even if they've had COVID, is that we have seen that natural infection, there's a pretty wide range of immunity. And mm -hmm. some people that probably don't get very sick or get a really low inoculum or low level of exposure might not have a very strong immune response. And so by giving a controlled dose of the vaccine, uh, we're really getting people, everyone to that kind of same level, ideally of immunity to the virus, which is high. And I, I do think that the reality is, as we've seen with the last time we talked about the changes in the virus and the mutations, uh, the reality is that we're probably going to need to get, uh, you know, revaccinated periodically to, to if there are variants which start to emerge, which are, um, you know, different enough from the current strains in circulation that we need a kind of a booster shot to, to cover the new strains of COVID that might be developing. Yeah. So we're still learning a lot about the vaccines, but we know that the preliminary data show that they're very safe. I'm excited to get my second dose and we'll just continue to give everyone updates on vaccination as they become available. Yep. So do you have any other last thoughts on vaccine? No, just to keep your, I mean, there's again, there's a lot of, just to go to very trusted yeah. sources of information. Um, there's, a, I think at one point there were 11 vaccine and clinical trials across the globe. So we'll continue to see more become available. Um, mm -hmm. And you want to learn there'll be differences in those and some you might be more comfortable with than others. And there's also differences, really, the, one of the big advantages of all these different vaccines is there's different ways of manufacturing them. And where we are with vaccines is a little bit like where we were testing, you know, six months ago, where the need for in this case, vaccines back then was testing far is far greater than our ability to produce them at this point. Mm -hmm. So the different vaccines will become available um, and just keep keep an eye on those, but they all will pass through the same level of scrutiny regarding their safety. And I do think that if you if you have the opportunity to take a vaccine, you can be confident that the, the FDA in this country uh, has really carefully scrutinized to be sure that it's safe in the near term. The chances of there, you know, now have we done years long studies on these? No, but the chances that there's gonna be long-term complications is actually quite low. Mm -hmm. So most of the challenges and problems with vaccines come shortly after vaccination. So, so I think that, uh, you know, be safe. If mm -hmm. you have a chance to get vaccinated, be informed. And if you really have questions, talk to your provider or someone. And if you are comfortable uh, getting vaccine, you should because it'll protect you from COVID and it would also help get all of us back to normal as soon as possible. Great points. Protect yourself, protect others. Yep. Well, as always, Bell, it's great talking with you. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more next week as, as I'm we sure. do, but it's always fun. <laughs> okay, talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.